Let's talk about Dungeon Crawl Classics character creation. Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to talk about creating a level zero character in Dungeon Crawl Classics. Level zero, you say? I guess you actually start as a peasant or a normal guy. And let's go ahead and show you a sample character page. So here's a sample character page, and I rolled this up using a purple sorcerer. Um, it's a site that has a lot of DCC content on it. And if you take a look, there are four characters that it randomly generated. And most of these are not heinous. <coughs> some do have some negative scores, and that's going to happen. But let's look. I mean, you would start off with four guys. That's normally what I would hand you, was a character sheet with either three or four characters on it. And at our table, we actually rolled and generated the level threes. If you're looking to expedite starting, you may want to start with something like these pre-generated characters that uh, uh, Purple Sorcerer can make for you so that your table can jump right into the game. But in this, you're starting with a Butcher, a Wizard's Apprentice, and let's look at this Wizard's Apprentice. He actually has some intelligence. We had a uh, player at the table that had a Wizard's Apprentice with an 8 intelligence, so he was obviously not going to turn into a Wizard, a Beetle which is kind of like a religious guy, and an urchin. So you've got a guy who is just an urchin, a street urchin, poor guy, whatever. And if you look at these scores, nothing really stands out. No 18s, no 17s. Um, you've got a 16 in stamina for this one character, and he has decent agility, so maybe he's a rogue. Um, he also has halfway decent personality and intelligence. So if you look at the modifiers, they do look a little bit different. I'll put a chart up for the modifiers um, to show you in a moment. But the pluses and minuses are different. A 12 doesn't get you a plus 1 like it would in other systems. You have to get a 13 for a plus 1. There are different breakpoints for each modifier. And that definitely makes it a little different. You're not going to have massive pluses on your characters like you would in D&D or Pathfinder, stuff like that. Um, so it does make for, in my opinion, a more interesting game. And you you have your normal saves like Reflex, Fortitude, Will. Uh, your speed is determined by your race. And what else? You've got your starting equipment, stuff like that. We'll explain where most of these things come from in a moment. But what I wanted to show is that you're not starting out as a fighter, as a cleric, as a rogue. You're starting off as a normal guy. I mean, you're starting off as a butcher or a street urchin or any possible things. There are elven glass blowers that I've talked about before. You're not going to start as a hero. You are starting as someone put in a situation and you become a hero if you survive and you get to level, level up to one and actually take on a class at that point. Now, let's talk about character generation itself. So the first thing you do when you're rolling a character is you roll. And unlike a lot of systems, you don't get to roll and then put the stats where you want. You roll basically right down the line. So you would roll your attributes, strength, um, agility, all the way down the line through luck, and you use 3d6. So you're not using 4d6, drop the lowest. Um, you're not using a point buy. You're not using any of these systems that other systems use. You basically do old school like we did in AD&D where you rolled 3d6, you went down the line, and you built a character. And that's what you do here. Now... Here's a chart that shows your ability score modifiers um, and some other information on it. You have, if you have a negative three, you're going to have negative three for your modifier. At four and five, you're at minus two. At six through eight, you're at minus one. Nine through 12, you have no modifier. You get a plus one at 13, 14, a plus 
and 15, a plus 2 at 16 and 17, and at 18 it's a plus 4. So where normally you would have a plus 4 on your uh, 18 modifier, it's a plus 3. And your pluses will not go up above that because you can't increase your ability scores. As you level up, you don't have a chance to increase ability scores or anything else. You are what you are. Now the other thing that your ability scores will affect are how many spells you know. And there's your chart on wizards, uh, as far as spells known, and then your max spell level. And it's possible, let's say you rolled a horrible character, it's the one that survives, and you have a really bad intelligence, but it's your best stat. It's possible, as you see, let's say you get a 10 through, what is it, 12? Or 10, 10, 11? Yeah, again. It's possible, let's say, that intelligence is your best score, and you only have like an 11. The max spell level you'll ever be able to get, regardless of how high you level up, is a third level spell. Um, it's, it, it is what it is. And it, it, like I said, it kind of goes back to when we played original AD&D, where certain races could only go to certain levels. And you can only hit certain spell levels with certain races, classes, stuff like that. It really goes back to a lot of the old school gaming where, you know, you were limited by your class. You were limited by your race. Um, your scores would limit you. And I, I really like that. It, everybody who levels up doesn't get to have all this stuff regardless of, you know, their ability scores. Your ability scores will limit what you can do. And in a way, I, I like it because it makes it more realistic. It makes those characters, I mean, the game looks at it like you're a normal guy and all these level zero funnels take you from, you know, you're in your village, something horrible has happened, and you step up to the plate to go ahead and right whatever wrong needs to be t taken care of. And you and a group of other commoners, you raise your pitchforks, and you may actually have a pitchfork as your weapon or your shovels, or whatever, and you go off to fight these evils. And it makes for, I mean, I, as I said in my previous video, it makes for an absolutely hilarious and fun day of gaming when you're doing the level zero funnel. But it also makes the characters, I think, more relatable. I saw, like I said, I, I see people that really, really get attached to some horrible characters. And it's... You know, they're rooting for these underdogs to get through, and sometimes they do, and that's what they're stuck with. I mean, I've got a guy at first level who rolled poorly for his for zero level hit points and started with one. And then when he leveled up to one, he rolled a one on the die for his hit points, and he doesn't have great cons, so he didn't, didn't end up uh, picking up any pluses. So he's a first level character with two hit points, and that thing is always risking death. It's, it's crazy. But it's also a lot of fun. So, you know, that's, that's just it. You're going to take the dice, roll it, and let me take a, take a step back here. I know there are people out there who can't really stomach the idea of everything being random, not being able to use point buy and pump up certain stats so that they can generate what they want. I'm going to tell you, you need to give the system a chance because it is so much fun. And you may have a great deal of fun with the worst character that you've ever played. I'll say the worst character. But it may be the most fun and best character you've ever played because of the game itself. And you, if you give it a chance, and I don't mean just give it a chance, go, oh, I'll try it, and then begrudgingly play it, and then, you know, you've already got this preset idea that you're going to hate it, and you hate it. Um, if you're going to walk in and do that, don't play the game. But if you're going to be like, man, I'm going to give this a try, and if I have a great time, I have a great time, and accept it, you're going to have an awesome time. And it's going to surprise you. Trust me. Just trust me on this. But let's get back to character creation. So after you've rolled your stats, you then go on and you're going to roll for your birth auger and your luck roll. Um... Now, these things, when you look at them, you're like, ah, oh, they're kind of useless. But so let's say you roll a one on this table, and it's harsh winner. You, if you have a good luck roll, you get to add your luck modifier to every attack roll. You're lucky. 
Now, if you get that and you have a bad luck roll, you're an unlucky person and it will affect your play. But a lot of times these things will work in your favor. Sometimes it works against. It just makes for other crazy things that uh, can happen in the game. I mean, you may roll awesome damage and then if you have bad luck, uh, it doesn't do as much damage, which just, you know, it's, it's crazy. But the monsters aren't ever going to have massive hit points. I mean, you're not going to have massive hit points. They're not going to have massive hit points. It's just the way it is. And so it makes the game so you're not going to steamroll anything. It's almost impossible. And it, as a result, it makes the game a lot more fun than what you're used to playing, where you're just going in trying to kill, 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 and it's, it's crazy. So the next thing you're going to roll is your... You're not even going to roll. You're just going to set up your, uh, your saving throws, which are Fortitude, Reflex, and Willpower. Those things are going to come off of Stamina for Fortitude, Agility for Reflex, Personality for Willpower. Um, so that's really simple. You're just going to take the numbers and transpose them over. And the following thing you do is you determine your starting languages. Now, as I've said previously, this game is absolutely random. And there are pages with the languages on there, and you will roll dice to determine what languages you know. And the same thing will happen when it come when you actually go to first level. You will not pick your spells. The dice will pick your spells for you. Now, it's possible that as a caster, let's say you get four spells, and you get four absolutely useless spells. I had somebody that did that in my group. And I let them pick two of them and re-roll randomly. And if they would have gotten two more useless spells, that's what they had. But I let them do that. They ended up getting a, a decent combat spell instead of just like light and stuff like that that they really wouldn't be able to use in combat so that they would be a little more usable in play. But that, again, is a first-level character. And we're not going to move on and go really into detail. But everything gets rolled. It doesn't matter. Um, you don't really pick anything except for one item, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, the next thing you'll do is roll your starting hit points. You roll a d4. It's modified by your stamina modifier. Let's say you've got a really bad stamina. It's minus 3, and you roll a 2. The least hit points you can have is 1, so you're going to have a 1. It's possible because you roll a d4 for your 0-level class that you're going to start with horrible hit points. That guy may survive. That's what happened with my player that had the uh, has the first level character with two hit points. He's got a bad stamina, and he's got some nice scores elsewhere, so he's running a cleric with two hit points, and he just keeps hoping he never gets hit. And it's kind of funny, but that's it's, it's the luck of the draw, the luck of the roll. The next thing you do is determine your starting wealth. Again, because you're a peasant, it's just random what you have in your pocket. It's going to be five D12 copper pieces. The next thing you do is determine your occupation. Now, I'm not going to put the table up, but you roll a D100, and the occupation table goes through, has races with their occupations. Um, so, like I said, I'm going to, I always use this, but let's say you're an elven glass blower. Um, that gives you the opportunity at level one, you can pick to be an elf. Your occupation is going to determine your race, so it's a random roll. Now, if you get somebody like the Urchin, it doesn't have a racial modifier in front of it. So you are a human, and that's all you can be for the duration of the game. So let's say you have an Urchin. He's great, uh, and he survives the zero-level funnel. You will then use that Urchin to pick your first-level class. And at that point, you can pick from Cleric, Warrior, uh, Thief, or Wizard. And those are the human classes. So, again, it's random, but it's part of what makes the game fun. And one of the things that I, like I've said before, what I like about it is it stops the power gamer from picking races for classes and doing all this other stuff. So the randomization does determine your race. If you're fortunate, maybe you get a halfling money lender, then you can pick a halfling, which are awesome dual wielders. Um, you get the uh, dwarven stonemason or something like that you can pick a dwarf as a class and they have aspects of warrior to them plus they have other other benefits because they're dwarves so again i know people aren't going to like that but give it a chance 
it's it is what it is. I mean, the way I look at it, the game actually makes you play the genetic lottery. Whatever you are given at birth, it is what you are. It's not I'm picking everything for myself. We don't get to do that. The game takes that into account and the dice will pick what your race is for you or what your race potential is. Now, let's say you do have the elven glass blower. Um, you can't keep the racial statistics. If you move to level one and decide, I don't want to be an elf, I just want to be a warrior, you're not an elven warrior, you lose every benefit that the elf gets, you're just a warrior. After you've determined your occupation, there is an equipment table, and I'll put that up here for you. And if you see, you get to pick, you get to let the dice pick a single random item that you have. Now, some items are good. Let's say you get thieves tools. That's a good thing to have. You won't have to buy it later on when you level up. Um, some things are semi-useless, uh, unless you're creative in your gameplay. So everything here is useful, but a lot of people aren't going to utilize them the way they should, so they may be useless to individual players. But, I mean, if you look, I mean, a crowbar, that could come into play if you're trying to get through a wall or something like that, that... Maybe you found a wall that looks out of place. The crowbar will let you get through it. Um, the grappling hook. If you have somebody else that has a rope, bam, you can climb. That takes care of uh, your climb checks for you. If you have a holy symbol, not going to be useful now, but it could be handed off to another player if you want, if they choose a cleric and you don't choose a cleric. Um, but everything on here is useful in gameplay. I like that they have the 10-foot pole, the old standby from uh, AD&D, where you used a 10-foot pole to check for traps and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's stuff in here that I, I really like and think is cool to have because it's just old school. Now, the next thing that you'll do, if you're an, if you're an elf or a human, you'll put your movement down, and it's 30 feet. A dwarf or a halfling, it's automatic 20 feet. Now, a couple of other things that you'll get... Uh, the Elf and the Dwarf get 60-foot infravision. Um, the Elf is sensitive to iron, which is bad. So if, let's say, you are an Elven glassblower and you have iron things, there are things that will happen. <coughs> You're immune to magical sleep uh, or paralysis. You get a plus four to detect secret doors. And you have passive checks within 10 feet, which is nice. The Dwarf... As I said, it's got 60-foot infravision. You can smell gold and gems, which is nice if you're hunting for treasure. You'll be able to smell that it's in the room. The halfling has 30-foot infravision, two weapon fighting built in, and a good luck charm. And luck does play a big part in this game. So you may want to look at that if you roll some halfling as your occupation. Um... But that's it as far as race. I do want to go back and talk about one other thing real quick. Your occupation itself, if you notice on the character sheets, there are no skills. You don't have skills in this. You can't become a skill monkey. Um, the way skills work, your zero level occupation will determine what skills you potentially have. Now, let's say you are that elven glass blower. I don't know, maybe you'll be good working with furnaces, stuff like that. Not necessarily crafting weapons, but you'd be able to find some type of skill. Let's say you are like the uh, halfling money lender. You're going to be good at intimidating people because you have to collect as a money lender, so you would have the intimidate skill. You may, I may even give you, you know, a, it's up to the GM, but I may even give you persuasion because you're trying to persuade people. Maybe you're a nice money lender and you don't like breaking legs, so you try to persuade people to, to pay up. Um, each of your occupations will determine what you're probably going to be skilled at, and each one of those skills is going to be a GM call. Now, let's say um, you have an occupation that wouldn't really give you certain skills, but you still want to roll on it. I mean, that's very common at most of these tables. Well, I roll, I roll, I roll. And it really makes no sense because these people are not trained in it. Everybody's not trained in everything. So this game takes that into account. If your occupation would let you have that skill, you get to roll a d20 in order to do a skill check. If your occupation makes no sense for a skill, um, 
then you roll a d10. So you are at a disadvantage starting off, and you're probably going to fail on the skill check unless you're extremely lucky and it's a low skill check. So again, I mean, the people that try to create skill monkeys and stuff like that, it doesn't exist. You really need to have a party that survives at level zero that has a well-rounded group of occupations in order to fill those skill slots down the road. That's a problem I've always had with games like D&D, Pathfinder, things like that, where let's say there's a lock pick, lock that needs to be picked or a trap that needs to be um, disarmed. You know, once the rogue fails, everybody else at the table, well, I'll roll, I'll roll. It makes no sense because they're not trained in lock picking. They're not trained in disarming traps. I mean, you don't call in a janitor in the military to disarm an IED. There are guys that do that. The janitor's going to get blown up if he fucks with it. He has no training. Um, you know, you do the palm disposal unit. It's the way it is. And as a DM, I rarely let people who are not trained in that stuff try to disarm traps. Um, I know people don't like it, but it's one of those things I don't care. It's a DM call. I don't let people who it makes no sense to do something because they're, they are not trained in it to just roll and do it. They, they don't get that D20. Um, so that's what I really like about this. You have to have the background in order to use the skill so that it makes sense. And if you don't, you roll that d10, you're at a disadvantage automatically, you can't roll more than a 10, and on a high level skill check, you're not going to do it. So, I mean, it is what it is. It, it, it's a game where things like that make sense to me, and I really like it. Let's move on to the one choice that you have to make, and that's your alignment. And at level zero, you pick your alignment. Now, some things you have to take into account. There are only three alignments. There are lawful, neutral, and chaotic. And let's look at the alignments. Lawful goes for unity, order, authority, loyalty, charity. Does what is right and just. Chooses the path of mankind over the path of supernatural dominance. Neutral. The balance of nature, the timelessness of eternity, the nothingness of space often worships those that came before law and chaos, measured morality, a balance of costs and benefits. And then chaotic, you have entropy, undermining of rule, nature, order, and the law of mankind, bargains with the supernatural, chooses the path of greatest personal power over principle. Now, where your alignment will become important down the road Let's say you have a cleric of law, and you, because you like to be edgy, choose a chaotic character. That cleric will not be able to heal you, or he'll be punished by his god. In this game, the gods, they describe them as petty and basically jackasses. So if you do something your god would not look well upon, which... Healing or helping someone who is uh, a minion of chaos, that law god is going to say, all right, you gain my disapproval for doing this. And what that means is, instead of failing on a natural one, you'll fail on a one or a two. So your disapproval will go up. If you're a lawful character and you do something chaotic and the GM's like, you know, that is extremely heinous and so far away from your alignment, you're now at plus 10 on your critical fail roll. So a 1 through 11 is a critical fail. Your alignment is extremely important in this game. And, I mean, if you're a law character and you heal that chaos guy and you get the plus one to the fail, the other thing is you can't heal them or do a lay on hands for as many dice as you could if you had someone who was in alignment or, you know, next to you. So, if a lawful character heals a lawful character, they can do max dice of healing. If they're one step away they're down a die. If they're two steps away, they're down even more die, so they can heal them even less. So your party really needs to think about what they're doing when they're choosing their alignment. And if you had the characters who 
like to play as jackasses. And this is the other thing. Let's say you choose to be a cleric of chaos. The only thing those clerics down the road can do as far as turning, there's not a thing called turn undead. Um, it's turn unholy. For a chaotic character, unholy are lawful things. So you'd be able to turn a paladin, an angel, things like that, that you will not be an encountering in any of these adventures. You're not going to be encountering good guys that you're trying to defeat. You're going to be encountering these evil things, and your ability to turn is totally negated. So what you can turn is determined by your alignment. And if you know you're playing campaigns, which almost everything I've seen written for this, and most campaigns that people are going to write, are you are going against evil. You need to be able to turn evil. Uh, law and neutral can do that. Chaos cannot. So you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage. Your lawful cleric can't heal you. If you're a chaotic cleric, you can't turn anything. You've negated a large piece of your power, and it's an extremely stupid choice. I mean, that's just my personal opinion, but, I mean, if you have negated your powers, it's a bad choice. Just don't do it. Um, and honestly, if somebody does that at my table and they're doing it to be disruptive, I'm not going to play with them. They're just not going to play anymore. They're gone. But... Let's move on. You do get to purchase equipment, and I'll put the chart up here. And if you look, there are some things that you're able to purchase, but they're so expensive, you can't. I, I mean, everything is a gold piece or above. The fact that you're rolling for copper at the beginning, you're not going to be able to buy weapons. You will find weapons as you go along, um, and you'll be able to use them. And that's the other beauty of... DCC, when you start as a level zero character, I mean, they assume you suck with all weapons. So you're just going to roll. You don't get any, any benefit for any of the weapons that you have. And you apply your modifier that applies for the weapon. So let's say you have a battle axe as a strength weapon. You have a bad strength. You're rolling a d20 minus that. Now, let's say you decide to try to dual wield and you don't have agility or agility sucks. As I, I kind of described it before with the dice chain in the previous thing, you know, normal attack rolls are a d20. You get, and you really can't dual wield unless you're a halfling as a level zero character. So you will have no real ability to dual wield as a base character because you get one action die. And if you have, but. I kind of let that go because most people have a bad agility and what will happen, let's say your agility puts you at minus two on the, on the main hand, minus three on the off hand. What that means is you're not subtracting minus two or three, you're subtracting dice down the dice chain. So you're going 16, uh, 14, or, or yeah, 16, 14, 12. So the minus three, you're rolling a d12 to hit. You're probably not going to hit. And the minus two, you're rolling a D14. Probably still not going to hit. Maybe, depending how bad the things are. So you're going to get punished for trying to dual wield. You can't just dual wield and do all this fancy stuff. You really need good agility to be able to do it. And there's a chart for that when you roll your level one character. Um, but what you'll do is you'll pick up weapons as you go along. I mean, we had characters that found bows. They found swords. They found all kinds of stuff in the level zero funnel that we ran. And as they pick them up, they use them. And, you know, they weren't good with them, but it's what it is. I mean, think about it. If you are walking along and you pick up a longsword, you're going to suck with it. But you're going to use it to defend yourself and fight if you have to, if that's all you have. Hell, if you pick up a firearm, a modern weapon, you're going to suck with it unless you've actually used it. So it takes it into account that you are going to suck with weapons and it doesn't really punish you for using a weapon you're not trained in at zero level. Once you hit first level, you'll have weapons that you're proficient with. If, as a cleric, you'll have weapons that your uh, god wants you to use that you have to use. At that point, you worry about what weapons you'll actually need and what weapons you'll buy. So let's move on. to armor class. Um, your armor class is determined 
by an, a standard calculation. It's 10 plus your AC bonus plus your agility modifier. Um, some professions, you will get to start with some armor, and they're pretty high up on the dice rolls. Uh, like a mercenary, you get armor and a sword. Certain ones, you will get weapons, a good weapon, and some armor. So you'll need to look those up. Um, otherwise, everybody's walking around in cloth. You're walking around in what you have as your profession. So your agility modifier will affect your AC. Negative agility modifier, you're going to be easy to hit. Higher agility modifier, you're going to be harder to hit. Now, on the plus side, the almost all the monsters in these zero-level funnels, they don't have huge two hits. And they have very few hit points until you'll get to the boss. And the boss is a true boss fight. Half your party will probably perish horribly, and that'll leave you with who you're going to be able to play moving forward. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. You're a guy in your clothes that picked up your pitchfork. You ran out to save your village. If you're lucky, I mean, my group did find armor and stuff, but it was hilarious because the armor and stuff they found, those guys that put it on ended up dying, and the unarmored characters survived. So nothing worked out for them. But that's the way it is. It's funny. The pile of dead is awesome. And that's about it. Now your final details uh, as far as the character. This chart will show you your initiative. Uh, you have one action die, a d20. And what that means, you're able to move and do however many action die you have. So you move, you have a d20. That means you can move into a single attack with a d20 roll. Your initiative bonus is standard. It's your agility modifier. Your attack modifier is plus zero. Um starting out plus or minus whatever the modifier is for that weapon so you start out at a flat zero that's the assumption that your guy sucks and is equally bad with everything and then if you happen to pick up a strength weapon you have a plus one strength you have a plus one modifier for that weapon you pick up a bow and you've got a negative modifier it's what you got so that's what you start with your crit die what that means if you crit in this system um, there's an actual critical table, which is kind of awesome. I'll put that up here right now. Here's a crit table for all level zero characters and all wizards. And let's say you roll a zero or less because you have negative luck. Um, forces of low shivers your weapon free of your grasp, inflict 1d6 damage with this strike, and you were disarmed. So you would do your normal damage with a weapon, plus an extra d6, and your weapon flew out of your hand because you just hit so hard. The best you can do, if you have a zero luck, would be strike the foe's kneecap, inflict plus one d4 damage, and minus 10 penalty to speed until healed for that creature that you hit. Um, if you're really lucky and you got maybe a plus three, uh, the seven would be what smash foe's hand, inflict plus 2d3 damage. With this strike, you break two of the enemy's fingers. Now, that being said, there is a critical fumble table. Let's take a look at that as well. You could have, let's say roll a four, your weapon is damaged, a bowspring breaks, a sword hilt falls off, or a crossbow firing mechanism jams. The weapon can be repaired within 10 minutes with 10 minutes of work, but it's useless for now. So for that combat, your weapon is screwed up. Um, as you go down, there are worse things that happen. Uh, you accidentally strike yourself for normal damage plus an extra one point. In addition, you fall on your back and are unable to right yourself until you make a D16 agility check. So you could just be like a freaking June bug on your back and unable to move. And it's kind of funny. But the critical fumble table, the critical hit tables, um, they do good things. They do horrible things. They're part of the game. You do pay for crits and you do get nice bonuses. Four crits. So a crit fumble you pay, and you get bonuses for that critical hit. So I, I, I really like that instead of just, oh, you get to double your damage or stuff like that, you randomly see what happens on those crits. And it can be horrible. It can be great. It's random, and I love it. And then the last thing you're going to do is choose a name for your character and move on. Um... They're level zero characters, but yeah, name them. Give them a name, become attached to those characters, and go ahead and play them. Um, hopefully, one of them will succeed, live through the adventure, 
and you'll get to continue moving on. Now, let's give you one caveat. It's possible you'll lose all four of your guys. You're not out of the game at that point. Most of these level zero funnels will have parts that you've come to where you found villagers and you rescue them. And they'll give you a limit of how many are there. Let's say you're the only unlucky guy. You've lost everybody. You'll be able to pick up two new guys. Roll real quick. Um, either that or if the DM wants to make this part a little bit easier, uh, what I would do is use Purple Sorcerer, make a whole bunch of sheets, ran cut them out so that they're not in groups of four, randomly shuffle, hand them out, and we keep going. Um, I mean, I really like the Purple Sorcerer site for that kind of stuff where I can just have a bunch of randos generated so that somebody doesn't have to sit there and spend another 10 minutes of game time making the characters instead of being able to move forward. And, I mean, it's GM's choice. If you want to wait and let them re-roll, do it. Otherwise, assign or do something like that. Um, and, again, I would encourage if you don't want to waste a bunch of time on the character creation process using the Purple Sorcerer site. But my players did actually enjoy the level zero character generation process. So, I think yours will, too. I mean, the... the it, it never fails. Somebody will, like, roll the first character, and they've got, like, threes and horrible numbers on there. Like, oh, my God, this is horrible. And then they finally start rolling, and they get a couple of guys who are good, maybe one that's awesome or better than average, and then they're happy. And then the worst thing that can happen is that horrible guy is the one that dies or, or survives, actually, and all their good characters die. So, But that's what they're stuck with, and then they're just going to have to learn to love that guy and have fun. But that's life. And that's the game of Dungeon Crawl Classics. But anyway, that's it for today. That's how you generate a level zero character. The process you go through. Um, I would definitely say do not let players talk you into, can I roll D4, D6 and drop the lowest? Stick to the process. Don't give them the chance to power build. Can I write the things down and put it where I want because I really want to play a cleric? Nope, you can't do that. Just... Play the game as the game is written, and I guarantee you, everyone or almost everyone at the table is going to have a great time. Like I said, my one power builder who was a problem, he rage quit, and that was not a problem. I didn't want him playing there anymore anyway. He was argumentative, he was a rules lawyer, and he couldn't live by not power building. So, um, if that's all you're in, it's, if that's the only way you can play a game, you probably won't enjoy this. Maybe you will. Uh, but if you are dead set against it and you walk in with a bad attitude and you keep the bad attitude at the table, I guarantee you're not going to have fun. If you're flexible, you enjoy gaming, you are happy playing anything, it's going to be a great game and you're going to have fun. Everybody in between, you're going to have fun too, so give it a try. But that's how you create level zero characters for the funnel. Um, we'll talk about leveling up in the next DCC video, creating level one characters, and make some other videos on DCC as well. But that's it for today. Remember to write, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, comment down below if you played the Level Zero Funnels, if you played it, or if you have any questions. And we will see you next time. Bye.